Today is going to be all about the Shield Breaker and what she can do for your party. You're going to hear a lot about the Shield Breaker and how some people are like it unlocks easy mode, uh, paid to win DLC, and she is a very, very strong character. I will not disagree with that. She does a lot of raw damage. She can go through any protection in the game. She can also make people not guard. I mean, she essentially is a switchblade. She can bring people out of stealth. She has DOT based abilities and she can also do the only form of block, I believe. And what I mean by block, she can actually reduce all physical damage coming in, which means when she gets marked, she can just do Serpent Sway as her ability. And thus she can soak up all of these marked based attacks, but not actually take any health damage. But she'll still take stress. Just keep that in mind when we get to that ability. She's definitely a strong character. She pretty much fits in any party because her row versatility is disgusting. But what I will say is she bounces around a lot. So the people you're going to put her in with, though she functions very well in many of the rows, she will start moving other people. So make sure the people around her are able to at least function when she starts moving between probably positions one and two. You might have like a weird two to three combo, but I usually have her bounce between one and two. Just make sure that person in position 1 can still function in position 2. A uh, somewhat famous example is a Hellion. She cannot really Iron Swan or use her other ability. I can't remember off the top of my head. I believe it's Bleed Out. She has to be in the first position to do those. And those are two of her abilities. And if you have both of those on, you just reduced half of her skill diversity. Now you can still have a Hellion and Shield Breaker because you can do other abilities such as Breakthrough and then Pierce. You can actually have them both dancing together. But it's just something to be aware of. So the only really unique thing about the Shield Breaker, I'm going to call this actually a potential spoiler. Even if you've bought the DLC and you just started using her, you may not know this. So follow the timestamp down in the comment section or description of this video. I'll put it in both because I do believe that people should be surprised for the most part when it comes to the game. I'm not even going to hint at it. It's a potential spoiler. If you don't really care, obviously just keep watching. You have now been warned. Unlike the Fledgling who has like a lot of individual weird personality things, the biggest thing she gets is when she campfires you can potentially have a 50% chance to enter what she calls a nightmare for 7 of these. These have snake like creatures, so we're not going to talk about them too much. If you've done it you know what I'm talking about and if you haven't that's why I don't really want to talk about too, too much more. So when you campfire just know you have a chance to enter a nightmare. And once you enter that nightmare, you'll figure out how to deal with those. She has seven, and once you resolve all seven, she gets additional campfire increases. And every time you complete one of those nightmares, you're going to get a trinket. I'm not going to show all the trinkets, but I am going to show one of the, I think it's the fifth one. Maybe six. I think it's fifth, though. For her background. A sandstorm of grace and fury, the shield breaker dances through the ranks, delivering precision strikes of remarkable power. Sundering armor, breaking enemy formations, and leaving the taste of venom wherever she goes. The shield breaker is a remorseless combatant. Yeah, I would argue her background description is very good based on all the abilities she has and also pretty much displays her fighting capabilities and what she does. Now, as usual, we're going to go to her weapon and armor so you can see what the decreases, increases, and just general HP and dodge of the shield breaker are going to be. The Shieldbreaker wields a spear and buckler, affording her impressive offensive reach and a modicum of protection. Her dancer's garb is better suited to the stage than the dungeon. She must be quick on her feet to survive. It's very interesting that they say her garb is better for the stage than the dungeon. She doesn't have a terrible HP or dodge, but I will admit it's not top tier or even probably average. It's probably below average, which is kind of surprising for based on how good she is in everything else. This is probably the only thing that really balances her out, so I can kind of see why that they would put a warning on that. Her final weapon is the Adder's Fang, damage base 918, very good, crit base chance 10%, very good with a speed of 9. I mean, her weapon is phenomenal. It's probably 4th or 5th highest damage base, crit base of 10%. I'm not as well rehearsed in my uh, critical base chances, but that's really high. And then obviously speed of 9, she's probably going to be going near the start of all the initiatives. Her final armor is Sirocco. Dodge is 28. It's very close to average. I think average in this game is about 30. So you figure she's 2 dodge below average. And her HP is 36, which is actually pretty small. But there are things that will increase her protection. Allow her to also just take 0 damage. And then there's other abilities to give her HP trinkets. Such as a building and the DLC district will give her increase, I think, by 10%. 
So she'll actually have 40 HP, HP if you have all the DLC and that building, but we're just going to pretend that she only has 36 without the building. But there are trinkets that give her like 33% more health, so you can imagine that will be increasing to about 48 HP, which is a lot better, which is why it's one of the trinkets I do have on there. Her first ability is Pierce. Pierce is probably going to be one of the main abilities you use for a lot of reasons. It only has a damage modification of negative 10%, which means you can still hit 9 to 17, which is much higher than some other people have for their base already. It also has a plus 9% modifier to her critical chance, which practically puts her at a 20% already, and that's ignoring other factors such as light level, quirks, or trinkets, and possibly other heroes. And to top all that off, if you thought, wow, this ability is really good already, hit any position, can be used 1 to 3, you get almost a 20% chance to crit, it armor pierces. Yep, that's right, so most of those enemies in the weld who have 50% armor protection at like, you know, 35, 36 HP, yeah, who cares? Other situations such as shamblers, does not matter, I mean, it's, it's clearly armor piercing. There's Uka savages in the cove, no one really cares. 50% protection, I believe, you can just go right through that and treat that like just the raw 60 to 80 HP they have. Very good. The only thing you could argue that is potentially bad, and I say only potentially because it can actually be very good as well, is that Pierce moves you forward one. As I said, this can be very beneficial, but depending on some heroes, it might be bad, and we'll, and we'll kind of discuss that right now. As I said before, if you have heroes who are very reliant being the first position, Pierce might keep shuffling them in and out of that position, and that hero may not be able to be as good as they could be. That's really the only bad situation, I would argue. Puncture. This ability is A, it hits every row for only a damage modification of 50%, so we're looking at about a 5 to 9, which isn't the highest, however, the fact it can be used at any row and moves you forward allows this to be a very good ability to help you get your party deshuffled, essentially. And it also has an accuracy of 110, just like Pierce had. Now, this is the weird thing that most of the other abilities don't do. It has a bypass guard, which I think only the Jester has on Dirk's stab. So that's already a unique mechanic. But then the only mechanic that exists on her is that she can break guards and then that target cannot be guarded those three alone is just so disgusting and then there's more to it then you got pull two forward so if it's like a squishy stress damage dealer it's now coming forward and it loses three speed now since this ability bypasses guard you're going to want to use this on the individual you do not want to be guarded do not hit the individual who's guarding i know it says it breaks guard but it means it breaks guard on the guarded individual i know that may seem kind of obvious at first but if you're in a panic and you haven't used this ability a lot you might think oh i'm gonna make sure that person can't guard no it's the individual you don't want to be guarded just just to clarify that but it's obviously excellent, it hits any position, can be used anywhere, moves you forward one, just like Pierce. So if you don't want to screw up your first two positions, this ability still allows you to function in that cyclical process. Adder's Kiss. This is a melee ability, and it's kind of one of her stronger ones, but not. It really depends what you're looking for. It's definitely one of her least row diversive abilities so far, as we've seen from the first two, because it can only be used one position on your side and it can only hit the front two enemies. So this is very reminiscent of abilities that hit very hard, but you usually have to do it into high protection based enemies. This ability also doesn't have a pierce. So this is just obviously really good for high stack HP enemies who can be blighted. There's a couple of enemies. Uh, the Corrupted Giants, I believe, have a decent blight chance resistance, but you could still use it on a Corrupted Giant because you don't lose the damage modification you still get that 9% critical modifier, the 110 accuracy, pretty good. You have about a fifth of a chance to critically strike, which means 5 points for 5 rounds is really good. That would be pretty much on the same level of Rhaenysaurus from the Fledgelant, which I praise, so I'm going to once again praise that DOT. And it would be about 27 damage and 5 points, so you could do about 32 points with a DOT. So it's definitely very good to use. You could, in a way, have this ability have two shield breakers cycle back and forth. The only reason why I'd slightly warn against that is, once again, the next ability we're going to look at is a little more formidable to do that with, but if you really like Adder's Kiss and you like the raw damage and blight, you could essentially just melt the front rows very quickly. I've mostly used Adder's Kiss before, as I said, just to get some blight and some higher raw damage onto very high HP enemies. Because Pierce is very good, but obviously you're missing out on the 5 points of blight you can potentially inflict. 
and also you get that minus 10% damage. It's not the worst because you're really only reality doing about 2 to 3 damage less if you get a critical and only about I think 1 if you don't. But just having the chance of doing your full 18, a full crit of 27 and then add 25 blight damage is just amazing. So I highly recommend Adder's Kiss if you're looking to get rid of just people with normal HP. Impale. Once again, this is a very limited ability, but as you look at it, it's pretty much like a Hound's Harry. But the only reason why it's slightly better than Hound's Harry in my mind is because she can do a little more raw damage than a Houndmaster can. Thus, this ability can be used with another Shield Breaker in a cyclical process where you just bash 1 through 4 on the enemy side every time. Now, it's very important to notice this is a ranged base ability, so if you do have any quirks hurting that, we're helping that ability impale, so don't just buff out your person with really strong melee damage and wonder why your impale isn't getting much stronger. Now, obviously, you can do generic damage increased trinkets, however, if you're going to go to a specific area, this is not the one to do so. And for being a skill that hits everybody, it still has an accuracy of 110, which is really good. The only real bummer about this ability is the minus 2 crit modifier, which puts her at 8%, but then as I always say, there's the three other factors. Well, actually, there could easily be four. There could be like campfire, quirks, other people, trinkets. I mean, there's so many ways to increase your crit chance that this could easily get bumped up to 15 to 20% without trying too hard. And then obviously we have a blight chance of 140%, two points for three rounds. This is really just a cherry on top, because if you use impale twice, you get like a critical in there. The four blight DOT might be enough to kill someone, and if it's not enough to kill them the first round, it might be enough to do it on the second. So, that's just one of those weird things. Now, what I will say about Impale is, this is the ability where you can get a Shield Breaker who has about 3 to 4 speed less. Obviously, you want to put them second, the faster Shield Breaker in front. First Shield Breaker Impales, the second one would naturally comes usually after that, so then you can impale again, and then the faster ones back in the front, impale, 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 everything dies if they're not a high protection based enemy. And the final thing, this ability, I think for the first skill or two, actually does not have a blight component. And I noticed I said the blight component isn't the biggest thing, but if you use this ability even like three times, that is six blight damage. It's pretty darn good. So not having it initially is a little underwhelming, and especially since obviously her weapon isn't near her max, this is a little underwhelming. I tend to use Adder's Kiss instead of this ability, and probably Apprentice and Veteran, but once I get the Champion, I make a hard switch to Impale, and usually Adder's Kiss will kind of fall off in the distance there. That's my personal preference. You may still like Adder's Kiss more. I just like the fact that Impale gives you chance to crit on some people, so it stress heals. And also, when she critically strikes, I usually don't mention critical strike buffs. But hers gives her 15% protection. That's right, 15%. Therefore, she gets like two criticals in a row. She has 30% protection now. On top of that, potentially 40 to like 50 HP if you have an HP item. She can essentially become like a leper in terms of the amount of HP she can have. So she can become very high in protection. And that will help her. And then she has camping skills that can increase her HP and protection. She can become a very strong tank while doing damage. And this is why she's kind of OP. She can have a lot of HP, a lot of protection. She can still pump out so much raw damage that she can just outclass other classes who don't offer that HP and protection that she gets from just naturally killing people. That's why she's a very good class. And Impale is probably one of her better abilities. And final shout out. Two Shield Breakers and Colors of Madness Endless Run is pretty much a surefire way to do it. How I did it was, I believe out of Vestal 4th position, Jester 3rd. You Battle Ballad, you get their speeds, accuracy, and crits to insane levels. You put some crit trinkets on them. They can easily be at 40-50% to 50 crit chance. You just keep critting with stress heals, gets them protection, and melts enemies very quickly, obviously. So in Endless, two Shield Breakers, varying their different speeds, of course. Jester Vestal, you should be able to hit that 300 achievement rather easily. You may not be able to the first time, depending on your RNG with bosses, but probably by the second or third, you should be able to get to that coveted 300 kill achievement. Expose. Accuracy 105. This is one of her least high accuracy based skills, but it's still technically average. So their damage modification is 40%. You're probably going to be doing about 5 to 10 damage, depending on what else you have. You can honestly change that, but we're not going to focus too, too much on them about the amount of damage. Crit mod of pretty much 7%, we'll bump her up to 17%, which is pretty darn good. Now this is going to move her back, so this is one of her few abilities that will move her back when she's not in the very front position. Obviously Adder's Kiss and Impale kick her back, but you know she's always going to end up in the second position. 
This could potentially put her in the fourth, which is kind of awkward, or obviously third, second, whatever, you know, wherever she's at. So that's something to keep in mind. If you have like someone in third position who doesn't want to get moved forward, let's just say a Vestal who's purely for heals and damage between positions three and four, if you suddenly kick a Vestal to second by accident, you can really mess up your party. Which is why I said at the very beginning, you need to be very careful of where she starts moving to. She has a lot of great abilities, a lot of great road diversity, but almost every ability she has moves her. So most of them move forward or only kick her back one, like I said, so she stays between one and two. But this is really one of those abilities where you can start getting a little awkward where if you use it in position two because you just impaled, well now your shield breaker's in position three. And your position three may not be so chill about being in position two. So it's just one of those things, just keep in mind when you're doing this, that is all. So what the heck does this ability exactly do? Well, it pretty much explains itself. It will expose the enemy by bypassing stealth and then obviously de-stealthing if it hits. Also, because every ability the shield breaker has just needs to absolutely destroy you, it's gonna give a 10% more chance crit received on that person, which is nuts, with a minus eight speed. So not only are you now de-stealth, you are now probably going at the bottom of the round, let's be honest. Even a 12 speed's gonna have four, which will put them maybe sixth or seventh place and turn round depending on uh, who you have on your side. And then the 10% crit received, you can now easily be at like a 33% or a 30% crit chance on that enemy. It's so disgusting. The only thing I will say is this does not hit the fourth position. This only works between the positions 1 and 3, and 1 and 3 on your side. If you do have a stealth enemy in the 4th position, she sadly cannot hit, but she's great for getting like the swine hookers and the warrens out of their stealth, and they're rarely position 4. Even if you have two stealthed individuals, you can at least de-stealth the first one in position 3, and then worry about 4, rather than having them both de-stealth. And if you do de-stealth position 3, you might be able to use a combination skill such as blinding gas or plague grenades from the plague doctor, and then take care of the 4th position. So even though she doesn't hit the 4th position, she can still help you directly hit the 4th position based on the enemy lineup. I have put on exposed a couple of times because she sometimes is my only de-stealther, and there is a lot of stress damage dealers that will hide out in the 3rd row, so it can be situationally useful for sure. Captivate. This is a range based ability which is kind of weird and this is, I gotta admit, this is an ability I rarely use because it functions off of marks but it can also be somewhat strong without it. Positions 2 and 3, 2 and 3 that she can hit on the enemy side. Accuracy of 105, it's average damage modification of negative 25% so probably 7 to 15 off the top of my head. Crit mod chance of 8%, you're looking at almost 20%, and then once again we get to these two interesting parts that essentially are going to make you choose this ability. I've really never used a shield breaker in a marking strategy, so that's 60% damage from a marked target. I don't know where and when I would, would use this. It certainly allows the shield breaker to be a possibility in a marking strategy, but really I think without that what they sh probably should have done because it's kind of like an arbitrary oh we'll give her 60 percent damage versus marked there is a trinket that also helps her do more damage versus marked so if you really really want her to be in a marked build go for it i would only say that this hits positions two and three which can be a little awkward because obviously you can't hit four or one so bigger bosses who take up either the back row or the front row like the two slots obviously she would be fine so i think this would work in most situations but I think there would be a couple where you're like, wow, I can't hit the first or fourth position with this ability, and I was building up for Mark to do so. It's my only concern. Other than that, the five points of Blight, I would have rather have seen that be six, and just get rid of the 60% Mark damage. Serpent Sway. This ability is the next unique gameplay mechanic that is introduced with this DLC. She will move forward one with this ability, and self two blocks. So the blocks are what I was talking about, where you literally will take zero physical damage. Now, you can still get critically struck, even though you take no damage, you will still take that blight, and I believe you will still take bleed DOTs and debuffs and marks and all that. So this ability doesn't save you from everything, it just blocks the raw damage. Obviously, it's great against opponents such as Corrupted Giants, normally they would do, you know, like 30 damage, 25 damage. Well, it's zero on the Shield Breaker. Now, if they decide to do Poison Spores or something, obviously that is not going to block that. 
and then obviously you give yourself a buff self speed of plus four so essentially you're probably going to go first next round with a natural speed of 13 and then anything else who knows how high your speed would be at that point Serpent of Sway is pretty good in situations if she starts getting low on health this will kind of stall it for her. Even if she gets attacked two turns in a row by raw physical damage dealers she's not going to take any damage so if she's at 10 HP she blocks two attacks she's still at 10 HP. And she gets four speed therefore she might go to the top of the next round so you can give her another two blocks and if you kill off an enemy there might be only three possible attacks left. And if there's only three possible attacks left, yeah, you can start doing the math. This can essentially just allow her to live forever as long as she doesn't have too many DOTs on her. So this can certainly help stall her death and allow your healer to eventually catch up with her. The other really cool thing about this ability is that it will allow you to maybe put a mark on her or to take advantage of a mark on her. What I mean by that is she can kind of act like a tank because if she's marked and you got a couple cultist sprawlers or fungal crawlers over there, if she's marked, she can do this, and they will still strike at her over anyone else. So someone else in your party can pretty much be low HP, but they're like, oh, she's got the mark, she needs to die. Suddenly your teammate your teammate gets a little bit chance to breathe and get some heals and stress heals while she takes all this damage, but not. So it's really good. It can save a teammate in those weird situations where this person gets marked. She can take a lot of the attacks. You can kind of reset for a round or two and then get back to what you were doing. It's a pretty good ability. Sometimes I have it on, sometimes I don't. It really depends on the dungeon and how I'm feeling that day. The four trinkets I got up here are pretty much just going to be all about increasing her speed, dodge, and damage. She's definitely a damage dealer and she needs to go quickly, strike quickly. So, you know, a lot of the stuff I have there is to either keep her alive. The other three are essentially to ensure she either goes first or the target she strikes essentially dies in one round. I'm not going to lie, I'm not really going to try to look up that name, but I will entertain you and try to say it once. Kirboyoli, like I said, probably butchered that, but you get the point, you see the trinket. It's very rare, plus 33% HP, minus 2 speed. Now, there are other trinkets that can not have negative effects, but 33% HP is pretty darn beefy. It'll put her at that 48 HP, and this can be very good on the slower shield breaker. Because I'm about to show you the other trinkets that are going to increase speed, while well, the one will... And you can put that on the faster shield breaker and then you can do your impale combo. So don't assume lower speed is bad because she'll still have 7 which is pretty darn good. So this gives her survivability and allows her to function in a shield breaker combo. I know the tempting goblet is very rare like it, it's just very rare. You have to kill a lot of bone royalty in pitch black to get this trinket. So you might get it like in 1 or 2 you might get it in like 20 who knows. But what I wanted to say about it is it's the plus 3 speed. Now she's got 12 speed naturally. 8 dodge. She increases her dodge to 36. And then she gets 20% HP which will bump her up to I believe 44 HP. So now she gets 44 HP which is really good. She gets 36 dodge which is I believe medium high to not if, if not the higher end of dodge. And 3 speed at 12 speed she'll probably go at the top of the round or at least have a good chance to. So this would definitely be great on your one shield breaker. You put the other item on the other. You have a 12 to 7 speed. You can see that that is pretty much statistically in your favor to have the first one at 12 speed go first. And then you have your other shield breaker follow up. Therefore, you can really use that cycle if you want to. Legendary Bracer. This one's not as rare as the others. It's still very rare, but you can obviously see which dungeons are going to have these. So you can hunt these down if you want. 20% damage, minus 1 speed, 10% stress. So what we're really looking at there is we can kind of negate the stress. It's okay. 10% is not too much. Unlike the Tempting Gauntlet that has 25. 20% damage will really help her reverse that pierce damage she's going to lose. So she's going to essentially make it like she can just always pierce with just full range of damage. Which is really good because it can hit any position. And also that minus 1 speed she's going to get. If you put that with the first item, you can now minus 3 speed. So if you don't have something like the Tempting Goblet that gives you so much speed, that's still 6 speed compared to 9 speed. Now you might be a little uncomfortable about 6 speed, but 6 speed isn't the worst. And after a round or two, your Shield Breakers will probably have some extra protection. If you bring in a good healer, they should be fine. The Legendary Bracer is obviously very good. It all reduces damage, decreases, and obviously allow you to strike between about maybe 9 to 20 if not maybe 10 to 20 depending on how high and how much the game wants to round into the next numbers for you. 
and as always, a focus ring. Why 10 accuracy? It's just going to give her an absolutely great chance to hit. 120 accuracy chance on Pierce. Even at 35 dodge, that's only going to put you at an 85% chance to hit. It's going to put her normal abilities almost at a quarter percent chance or 25% chance to critically strike, which she then gets that protection of 15%, which is why I don't mind the 8 dodge so much, because the 8 dodge can kind of be made up for based on the fact you might get a couple criticals, which will then give you the protection, which will kind of help decrease any raw damage coming into her. For her campfire abilities... Though quiet and demure, while the fire blazes, the Shieldbreaker is haunted by nightmares of her past. These visions are so powerful that she must vanquish them in the dreamscape or awaken sluggish, tired, and stressed. You know, I never really read her campfire description until now, but I guess they try to warn you. I mean, that is a fair warning that she is going to be haunted by nightmares that you must vanquish and stab the crap out of them. So, yeah, good on them, I guess. Snake Eyes. Time cost 3. All companions, 50% armor piercing. I've used this one on occasion. If I don't have any other like really good campfire abilities on, but this one's available, and if I have not completed all the campfire nightmares yet, I'll actually put this on because a lot of the snakes, I think if not all of them, have some form of protection. So the fact that some of your companions can get through that protection if they're more of a raw damage dealer is actually rather helpful, and a time cost of three is not the most detrimental to your camping. Snake Skin. Once again, a time cost of 3. This one is self only, but it's 15% protection, which is pretty darn good already, and then 15% max HP. Which brings me back to the Focus Ring, which is why I really don't mind losing 8 dodge, because guess what? You can get 15% more HP and 15% more protection, then if you critically strike, you have 30% protection. And then, I believe, if you finish all the Nightmares, I think for two battles you get 10% protection. So if you use this ability and get a Critical Strike, you're at 40% protection with 15% more HP. This is why she can be very survivable once she gets going, once you finish her Nightmares, you get the Campfire skills. She can be a very strong, durable heroes with strong damage, and that's why she's just so darn good. Sandstorm, time cost 2. One companion cannot be marked. This is a very interesting one, and maybe if you're struggling with the Swine God, King, Prince, whatever, whatever form, this might help you if you're like, you know what, I'm tired of this individual just getting bursted by the Swine God. Go ahead, put it on. It's time cost of two. It's really good. It'll essentially save that individual from getting marked, so you know the other three are the ones you have to worry about. I've also just used it on other people, like if uh, you're fighting a lot of spiders or stuff like that, you can maybe put on your healer or your third row because they often get the ones marked. You could do that as well. Adder's Embrace. Time cost 2, self only, 20% chance to the blight skill and 20% blight resistance. I might have used this once. I guess if you really like her blight based abilities this would be good, however like I said, Impale, it's nice if the Blight happens, but if I really had to choose between this and just one more point for Snake Skin, I really wouldn't see why you wouldn't take Snake Skin. I, I mean, four battles for more Blight, uh, it's just so weak. If this was a time cost of one, I'd be like, okay, you know what, it's a time cost of one, sure. But for a time cost of two, I think her other abilities are much better than this one. I mean, it can make Adder's Kiss probably land reliably, but I just don't know if that's really worth a time cost of two. The Shieldbreaker can feel like pay to win and can be pretty overwhelming. She's absolutely does very well in the Crimson Court, and I use her a lot, just like the Fledgling in the Crimson Court. She can solve most boss issues by either just offering decent damage or great row versatility. The Shieldbreaker can make some of the original bosses and enemies feel a little outdated, because she can do so much damage while also bypassing obsolete guard and protection. I have a feeling maybe, and this is just a weird small side rant, we might see more Shieldbreaker like people in Darkest Dungeon 2, but a significant increase in enemy difficulty. Because the Shieldbreaker has a lot of cool mechanics, and it feels like she almost belongs to a modded class based on everything she can do and how good she is. She can obviously still die, her HP is lower and her dodge isn't as high, so if you're not getting a lot of critical chances and don't increase her HP, you can't exactly be too cocky with her because she can die within literally 2-3 to three rounds of damage because of her lower HP. Thank you so much for watching, like and subscribe below.